Hello, I'm Lenny Pinna, and I'm the publishing editor of this book, A Face from Uranus, Correspondence Between Ted Burr and Henry Bellaman, 1943 to 1945. I am also the screenwriter for the six-part limited TV series In the Name of Jamie Wakefield, which is based on the letters contained in the book A Face from Uranus. The pilot for In the Name of Jamie Wakefield premiered on October 27th on YouTube, and so this reading series that I'm about to embark upon is meant for those who have seen the entire series pilot. Uh, if you have not, I would recommend watching the pilot before watching this video because there's really no way you'll know what's going on. It's not a formulaic structure. It's a very complex structure. One would have to see the pilot to even begin to understand what I'm about to read. So for those of you who have seen the pilot, uh, I'm moving on to episode two, which is called Hidden in Bellevue. And if you'll just think about the end of the pilot where... Uh, Ted had received a letter from Henry encouraging him to write to him and tell him his complete story. And Henry is having a conflict with his wife, Catherine, because he's having trouble writing the sequel to King's Row, the novel in which uh, he brought him a best-selling claim to fame. And he has to go back to the past to sort of face some things in order to write that sequel. And so we're picking up there in this second episode. So fade in. There is a, going to be a series of images in the town of Bellevue, Ohio, as if you were walking through the town. There are no people. It's as if one person is in their interior mind walking the streets of Bellevue and, and contemplating their lives in Bellevue. So with Ted's voiceover, the images begin. Buried in the fertile loam soils of Ohio is Bellevue. It is a town of several thousands. Its streets are lined with flowing maples. The sun sends dusty shoots of light through the abundant leaves to the weedy gardens neatly placed at the side of each house. It is quiet and warm everywhere. On a Sunday afternoon, one either naps or trudges to a solitary theater for a matinee, after which there is the lure of a dingy ice cream parlor, all ends in the walk home as cool darkness is scented with the odors of frying foods. These images now culminate at the exterior of the Burr family home in the evening. There, from the street, a light can be seen in Ted's upstairs bedroom window. We hear Ted say, in voiceover, hidden in this massive world is Bellevue. The camera moves through the curtains to show Ted typing at his desk, and Ted says, and hidden in Bellevue is Ted Burr. He stops and closes his eyes for a moment. The scene then dissolves to the interior of Henry Bellaman's study at the Ansonia Hotel apartment in which he and Catherine live. Henry is perusing his bookshelf for some inspiration. He looks through a section of poetry. He pulls out a book of his poems that had been published years earlier. As he thumbs through the book, a piece of paper stuck in the middle as a page marker causes the book to open to a particular page. Henry opens the folded sheet of paper. His breath quickens. It is a handwritten poem. Close up of the handwriting. Paradise in Paris. Love, Albert. A close up of Henry's face as he reads Albert's voice is the voiceover reading the poem. We found ourselves in a hidden garden, ancient and divine, our bare feet planted in unspoiled soil. We stood naked and unashamed. The flesh on our bodies was sculpted by an artist of world renown. From the fountain of our hearts poured eternal love. Come and drink, the wind whispered, Come and taste 
beckoned innate desires. We partic partook of the fruit of the tree of life, and we saw that it was good. The scales have fallen from our eyes, and we know the truth. In paradise, we are free to live and love in peace. Amen. Deeply affected, Henry closes his eyes. The scene dissolves to a flashback. It is the interior of a college classroom, Columbia, South Carolina, 1919, in the day. The last group of students exit the class lecture room of Professor Albert Berghauser. He gathers his class materials and places them in an open briefcase. Henry slowly peeks in the door in the back of the classroom and enters. Professor Berghauser. Yes. Albert looks up to see Henry. He is momentarily shocked, but quickly recovers. Dr. Bellaman. They stare at each other for a moment, not knowing what to say. Albert covers with humor. You miss the entire class. Henry plays along. I'm sorry, Professor. Is there any way I can make it up? How do you propose to do that? I'd like to go over everything I've missed. I see. I'm afraid it's too late. Your absence cannot be made up so easily. Perhaps you could offer me private tutoring. I'm sorry, I no longer offer private tutoring. Catherine doesn't know I'm here. How is Mrs. Bellaman? She's quite busy with her teaching and vocal trainings. Have you heard the news? I'm engaged to be married. Really now? To who? Miss Elsa Powell of the Tennessee Powells. They now live here in South Carolina. Quite impressive. You're marrying up. I'm marrying well. You still live by comparisons. I consider them necessary to know where one stands in the world. So do you consider yourself up in the world? Not yet, but I am climbing steadily. I've come to accept where I am. It's respectable. Yes, teaching is respectable, but not renowned. You could have become renowned. I took the time to earn a PhD. What? In German? How original? Comparative languages, French and German. At least it's not a faux doctorate. Oh, I beg your pardon, an honorary doctorate of music, no less. How's that for comparison? It doesn't matter how one gets where one is going. Becoming important is what counts. Being satisfied with oneself is ultimately what fulfills a person. I think I'm becoming a rather fine teacher. I've just become the editor of the state's newspaper literary column. You will see my front page column every Sunday. I'll be sure not to miss it. I'll have you know that I am also writing poetry now. Well now, that is impressive, trying to get in touch with your soul. One of us must become a renowned poet if one has the necessary talent or the determination. You certainly have that. You had the talent. Who knows, perhaps still do. It's too bad we couldn't have been bound into one person. We each seem to possess the qualities the other lacks. Henry recites from memory May we grow together, forever entwined, encircled with the rings of countless years. Our blossoms bring forth a kind of fruit 
that will feed future generations of kindred souls. Be remembered and touched. So, I do still have a place in your heart. Always. Do you remember Paris? We. Oui. It will always be our gay Paris. Together we would have but become unstoppable. Perhaps, if society weren't such a roadblock. And Catherine. Yes, you will always have Lady Macbeth at your side to fuel your ambitions. And you will always have Miss Powell to provide you with the finer things in life. Funny how money attracts money. We've each made our bed, Henry. I rest quite comfortably in mine, with a clear conscience. End flashback. Henry's brow is tense as he slowly opens his eyes. The sound of knocking. Catherine pokes her head in. You're up late. Henry doesn't turn back to face her. He just turns his face slightly. Yes. Are you all right? Yes. No. What's the matter? You don't want to know. I do, if it would help. Not right now. Is it the sequel? The sequel is merely the symptom. It's not the cause. Perhaps it's better to rest now and start fresh in the morning. There is to be no rest now. Can't you understand that? Pandora's box has been opened. There can be no rest until the past is put to rest, or else I'm laid to rest, whichever comes first. Henry, please don't talk like that. Catherine, will you please just let me be? Fine. Good night. Catherine shuts the door. Henry breathes deeply. We cut to the interior of Ted's bedroom at night. He continues typing his letter to Henry. We hear Ted in voiceover. These were my thoughts after reading your letter. I hardly dared to expect an answer from you, yet here it was, kind and inviting. A part of you found a way to me, insignificant me. There's a close-up of Ted's eyes watering. His voiceover, how proud I am and grateful. We dissolve back to the interior of the Bellman apartment, their living room, day. Henry plays Bach on his grand piano. Catherine enters. Henry notices her, yet continues to play until he finishes a movement. He closes his eyes and holds still listening to the fade of the final note. Catherine waits until he opens his eyes. I'm impressed. A Bach fugue this early in the morning. That's rather ambitious. It's good exercise for the mind. Is it helping you with your writing? Henry looks at her in silence. Or is it a distraction from your writing? At the moment, it expresses me in a way that writing cannot. I think we still want to be known for our accomplishments, do we not? I think playing a Bach feud is an accomplishment. True. I just thought I'd let you know, since I don't have any voice lessons scheduled for today, Estelle invited me to go shopping with her. We'll have lunch out, but I'll be home for dinner. Enjoy your day off. Thank you. Give Estelle my regards. I will. So you will have a quiet day all to yourself, should you choose to write. Perhaps today will be the day my muse shows up. It might be more prudent to focus on accomplishment. I've been doing that. It hasn't been helping. Last night, 
you claim that you can no longer identify with Paris. Are you really so sure? Henry remains silent, wondering where she is leading. It seems to me that you and Paris still have much in common. He has a great need for accomplishment. Like you, he went abroad. He gained a vast amount of knowledge and wisdom from his experiences. I would think Paris has an even greater need now to go back to King's Row to prove himself. Perhaps he can now accomplish something that he couldn't before. Music. He returns to music. What do you mean by that? He let go of his music to become a doctor of psychiatry, but now that he's accomplished that, as head of the state sanitarium, he needs to get back to his first love. His love of music. Desperately. Well, that's a start. If you add the fact that he is married to Elise, a young musical prodigy, what's the connection? It seems logical to me that Paris is ready to mentor someone younger, like he himself was mentored. With Elise, he could focus on both, mentoring and marriage at the same time. Now that would be an accomplishment. I guess it's possible, but where would the dramatic tension come from? But of course, I got it. Vera Lashinsky. Vera Lashinsky. What about her? Having performed famously around the world, she is now forced to come back to King's Row to take care of her aging father. She'll be psychologically tortured by his turn of misfortune. And she'll need my help. I mean, Dr. Mitchell's help. And her suffering plight will help him to reignite his passion for music. Of course, and will also ignite his passion for a love affair with her. That makes perfect sense. It will expose his obvious weakness in marriage, which leads to all of his inevitable infidelities. You're right. I imagine it would do that as well. What would I do without you? I'm sure you would have thought of something eventually, darling. I'm just here to help you move things along. Cut to the interior of Henry's study at night. He writes with some energy. His voiceover. It had been three years since Paris saw Vera Lashinsky perform in Vienna. He remembered her radiance and the resounding standing ovation she received. Upon returning to King's Row, Vera made good use of her talent as a high school music teacher. Perhaps she and Paris together were meant to inspire forward progress here in King's Row, he thought. We dissolve to the interior of a high school classroom It's King, in King's Row, 1915 day. The last of the students depart the classroom. Paris played by the same actor who plays 30-something Henry, pokes his head in as Vera gathers her materials. Miss Lashinsky? Yes? Vera looks up, delighted. Well, look who it is, Dr. Paris Mitchell. She quickly changes moods. Whatever are you doing here? I came to see you, of course. How strange. For a moment, when I looked up and saw you, I thought we were back in Vienna. Yes, you looked bright and gay for a moment. And then I remembered exactly where I am, here in King's Row. I'm here in King's Row too, Vera, and I am very glad to see you. How is young Mrs. Mitchell? She's quite busy with her music, it's music studies. She doesn't know I'm here. I'm engaged now, Paris. Oh? Since when? It, it's strange. Uh, I haven't heard. That's because 
you are the first to know. It happened last evening. You don't say, but to who? Who's the luckiest man in the whole wide world? I'm not sure how lucky he is. His name is Albert Powell. He's one of the Powell family that moved here from Tennessee. Impressive. You're marrying well. If one really cares about marrying well. Marrying well means something here in King's Row. I know. I'm giving in to convention. In order to live or survive in King's Row, one must appear respectable. It does make one's social life easier, even if it makes one's personal life more difficult. You remember Vienna, don't you, Paris? How could I ever forget? Marriage was the least of our desires. Yes, we made love and music together. And that was more important to us than an empty marriage. It was like hearing for the first time a strange, beautiful music. I think it is still possible. The miraculous Debussy preludes and the mysterious pagodes. We could play together again, Vera. I'm no longer a renowned musician, Paris. I'm just a respectable teacher. That doesn't matter to me, Vera. You and your music are still important to me. And what of your own music, Paris? I must confess lately I'm having great difficulty in composing anything of importance. I'm in desperate need of a muse. <laughs> Vera throws her head back and laughs strangely as she moves to the window, looking out. What's so funny? The thought of me becoming a muse for you. It amuses me. <laughs> Paris moves behind her. I've missed you more than you will ever know. Paris kisses the back of her neck. And what of Mrs. Mitchell? What of her? What if she should find out? She won't. A knock at the door. The knock at the door was not in the scene. The knock at the door takes us back to Henry's reality in real life. So, knock at the door. There's an offstage voice. It's Jocelyn the maid. Mr. Henry! Yes, come in. Jocelyn enters with a tray with tea and Henry's mail. Thank you, Jocelyn. You're very welcome, Mr. Henry. Sorry to disturb you. It looks like you're busy writing. That I am. It's good to see the power of prayer is working. Please keep it up, because I have a long way to go. We all have a long way to go, Mr. Henry, and that's why we give thanks and praise each and every day to keep us going. No biscuits today? I'm sorry to say that Miss Catherine informed me that I'm not to make you some of your favorite foods. Did she now? She said on account of the doctor being concerned about your heart. I'm not happy about it. But I suppose she's right. I'm not happy about it either, but one must abide by what's meant for our own good. It's the same with God. I've had to learn how to abide. I understand. I've had to learn to abide as well. But God is blessing your writing now, so I'm going to let you get back to your work, and I'm going to get back to mine. Amen. After she exits, Henry takes a sip of tea. He sees a thick blue envelope in the stack of mail. It captures his attention. He pulls it from the stack and reads the return address. There is a close-up of the letter. It says, Ted Burr, 161 Sheffield Street, Bellevue, Ohio. He cuts the envelope and retrieves a very long letter. He begins reading, and we hear Ted in voiceover. These were my very thoughts after I had read your letter. I had hardly dared expect an answer, yet here it was. 
kind and inviting. We then cut to Ted's bedroom in the evening when he is typing the letter, and there's a close-up of his illumined face, and we hear Ted say, A part of you had found a way to me, insignificant me, how proud I am and grateful. We cut back to Henry's study, and he now stands and moves to a high back upholstered chair, which is by the window. We hear Ted say, You have brought me happiness, a zest for the future, so I shall tell you my story, the whole story. Cut back to Ted typing. We hear his voiceover. I regret to say that it isn't a pretty story, but King's Row has instilled within me such an admiration and faith in you that I shall not hesitate in throwing open my very soul. We cut back to Henry's study, and he feels a little bit of a heart disturbance. He holds the letter and his arm to his chest, closes his eyes, takes a couple of deep breaths. He then opens his eyes and resumes reading. Ted's voiceover. I was born July 26, 1924, so I am 19 years old. Not long ago, my mother confessed that before my birth, she prayed that I would be a girl. She desperately wanted a daughter. If only my mother's prayers had been answered. Yes, my troubles began when I was very young because I thought I was a girl. Henry stops abruptly, his eyes narrow in disbelief. He drinks some tea, and then he forges on to read the letter. We dissolve to the Burr family home, outside the home, next to the neighbor's house, where six-year-old Ted and his older sister Martha are playing with several girls from the neighborhood. A couple of the girls finish dressing Ted in baby doll clothes. He then climbs into the buggy to be pushed around. Ted, become, Ted beams as the girls giggle with delight. We then cut to when he's eight years old. We're inside the Burr home on the stairs and hallway, and Teddy is skipping on his way up to his room. His maternal grandmother can be seen through the open doorway of her bedroom. This is Grandma French, his maternal grandmother, as opposed to his paternal grandmother, Grandma Burr, who was sitting on the porch in the pilot. Grandma French uh, had died during the years of the pilot, so uh, this is a flashback to when she was alive, and um, she calls to Ted. Teddy, come Teddy, come see my beautiful jewels. Ted enters her bedroom and goes to the jewel box she has opened for him to see. He peruses the items and holds up a few pieces. Grandma French sits in her chair and reaches for her prayer book and her hair comb on the side table. Teddy, come comb Grandma's hair. With dedicated interest, Teddy takes the comb and from behind her chair, he slowly combs his grandmother's very long white hair while she reads her prayer book quietly aloud. We go back to Henry's study, and we see that his memory is triggered. We dissolve to a memory of his own childhood in his grandmother's home, which is where he lived. And this is Grandmom Oswald. She was a German immigrant. She's finishing sewing a white ruffled collar and ruffled cuffs on Henry's school shirt. An eight-year-old Henry sits at the dining room table reading his schoolwork. Heinrich, come. Put this on. Henry goes to her, takes off the shirt he is wearing. Over his undershirt, Henry puts on the ruffled collared shirt. Now put your jacket on. As Henry puts his jacket on, Grandmom Oswald adjusts the fluffs of the ruffled collar and further pulls out the cuffs. Stand tall. My goodness, you are the very picture of a proper young man. Henry grins. We dissolve back to Henry, who has the same grin on his face as he is remembering his grandmother. He resumes reading. 
We cut now to the exterior of a Bellevue neighborhood, neighborhood where there's a sand lot, and boys of varying age are picking teams for baseball. Ten-year-old Ted stands on the sidelines with another little boy. They're the last ones to be picked. Ted's two brothers, Lynn, the older one, and Mark, the younger, are already picked and on opposite teams. A boy on Lynn's team says, Should I pick your brother? Lynn, No, we don't want the little sis on our team. Let Mark take him. So the boy says, I'll take Johnny. Lynn laughs. <laughs> Mark, you get sissy. The boys on Mark's team grumble with disappointment. Mark sympathetically says, Come on, Ted. Ted runs to Mark. I'll do my best, Mark. I, I promise. A boy says to Mark, Mark, why don't we let him keep score? He says to Ted, You want to keep score for us? Sure, anything. Uh, another boy says, You can also be our cheerleader. The boys giggle as they take the field, leaving Ted on the sideline. We go back to Henry's study, and there's a close-up of his, of his face, and we can see that he is sympathetic as he remembers his own childhood difference. We dissolve to his childhood home. Now 10-year-old Henry plays a composition on the piano. He hears boys playing outside. He stops playing and moves to the window. He slowly pushes the curtain aside just enough to peek out at the boys playing baseball across the street. His grandmother enters carrying a plate of pastry. Heinrich, why have you stopped your lesson? I was interrupted, Grandmum, by the sounds outside. Heinrich, you will accomplish so much more in this world than those silly boys out there. Keep practicing your concerto. Yes, Grandmum. Here is strudel for you when you are finished with your lesson. Young Henry smiles as he sits down to resume playing on the piano. We cut to a Bellevue grade school classroom. It's a sixth grade teacher is rigging up a white curtain and she's putting it over half of the classroom as she's creating a mock radio broadcast station. While everyone is helping to set up, Ted goes behind the curtain, steps up to the microphone, and begins to sing the Indian love call in a high soprano voice. When I'm calling you, will you answer true? The class stops, stunned by this beautiful voice. The teacher peeks behind to see who is singing. She is surprised and delighted to see it is Ted. We then cut to a Methodist church, the inside, it's choir practice, and Ted is belting out a solo hymn in the choir loft. He adds his own vocal flourishes throughout. The organ player struggles to play the hymn as written and looks helplessly toward the choir conductor. The choir director, who is enamored with Ted's virtuosity, speaks in a whisper to the organ player, Just follow him, whatever he does. We then cut to the interior of a lady's lodge in Bellevue. It's daytime, and Ted stands on a stage singing for the women's dinner party. The women are glowing with appreciation. Ted is singing Mother McCree. We then cut to the interior of the, bar, the Burr family car, where Ted is hiding in the back seat until his mother gets into the driver's seat of the car. Ted peeks up over the back of the seat. What did they say, Mom? What did they say? They said you could be in the movies. They think you are a, every bit as good as Bobby Breen. Ted beams with delight. We are now in the Burr's home living room at night. Extended family is celebrating the Christmas holiday. Everyone is listening to the Burr children play piano. Lynn, the oldest brother, finishes the last few bars of a very simple song, and everyone politely claps. Ted's mother, Teddy, will you play for us now? Everyone's excitement level raises as Ted sits at the piano. With poise and precision, he performs a challenging classical work. 
it is apparent that he is in his element, and he shows it off with ad added hand flourishes and a pleased with himself smile. He glances over at Lynn with a gloating look. He knows he is superior in this arena. Lynn's flushed face begrudgingly shows his inferiority in this area. We cut now to a neighbor girl's house during the day, and 13-year-old Ted and his sister Martha and the girls are dressing up in gowns and makeup. One of the girls says, oh, Look at Tadira French. Another girl, You look so beautiful in blue, Tadira. Ted, Does it bring out my eyes? Girl one, My goodness, yes. And girl two, you're wearing just the right amount of mascara, too. Martha says, she has our mother's eyes. Feeling beautiful, Ted smiles radiantly with the attention. We cut to Henry's study. We can see Henry's expression is clearly uncomfortable with what he is reading. But we dissolve to a flashback in his mind, which is the interior of the Albert Berghauser home. We're in Albert's bedroom. They are both teenagers at this point. Albert's large bedroom is well appointed with frilled curtains and polished wood furniture. Albert pulls the bed covering off the bed and wraps it about his shoulders like a cape with a long train. Sometimes I like to pretend I'm one of the royal family. I tie this on and let it trail behind me. Albert demonstrates as he walks slowly across the room with a regal demeanor. Henry is fascinated by Albert's uninhibitedness. Albert slowly pivot turns so that the long train drapes sensuously around him and his legs. Albert role plays. I command you to kneel before me. Henry hesitates with some embarrassment. Albert keeps his composure and waits. Henry summons up the courage to participate in the role-playing, and he moves to Albert, kneeling before him. Albert extends his right hand gracefully in front of Henry's face, signaling it is Henry's duty to kiss his hand. Henry looks at the hand and then up at Albert. Albert raises an eyebrow with an expectation for Henry to obey him. His eyes twinkle, though, as he curls his lip to signal, I'm playing with you. Henry melts with Albert's subtle humor. He fully commits to the part he is being summoned to play. With reverence, he extends his hand palm up to take Albert's hand and slowly, solemnly kisses the back of it. He then looks up to Albert with a devotional look and a pleased with himself performance. Surprised by Henry's rise to the occasion, Albert is profoundly moved and he feels quite vulnerable and exposed. He breaks the moment suddenly and walks away and removes the cape. Henry doesn't move. He realizes the truth of their relationship has just been revealed in that moment. We dissolve back to Henry's study. He lingers in his thoughts for a moment. Returning to the present, he sips some tea and resumes reading. We cut to the exterior of a main street in Bellevue. 14-year-old Ted and his sister Martha walk down the street window shopping. Ted wears makeup and his hair is perfectly coiffed. He wears feminine slacks and blouse. He and Martha relate as sisters. While walking on the sidewalk, they notice Joan and her mother coming toward them in their signature arm-in-arm -arm walk with perfectly synced steps. Their matching periwinkle blue taffeta dresses are somewhat outdated but still quite haute couture for Bellevue. Various heads in the town turn and look and snicker as they look at them. The two women, as they pass Ted and Martha, shyly smile and nod at Ted and Martha, and 
Ted puts, after they pass, Ted puts his arm in Martha's arm. They giggle at themselves as they start to mimic Joan and her mother walking in similar synced fashion. They also turn a few heads. We cut to the interior of a women's clothing store. Ted looks through a fashion magazine. Martha emerges from a dressing room in a new dress. My, that fits you perfectly. What do you think, Ted? It does fit you well, but the color doesn't complement you at all. Martha says to the sales clerk, does the dress come in any other color? She condescends, I'm afraid not. It is one of a kind. Martha says, oh well. And she turns back to the dressing room. The sales clerk, you don't want it then? Martha over her shoulder, no, the color won't do. As Martha re-enters the dressing area, the sales clerk glares somewhat irritatingly at Ted. Ted senses her disapproval, so he flips through the pages of the fashion magazine with a pretend haughtiness to avoid her eyes. We now move to a scene when Ted is uh, 14 years old, and he is riding a bicycle on the streets of Bellevue in the early morning on a paper route. And um, he stops at this mansion, and I'm going to show you that mansion right here. It is the uh, John Wright Mansion, which was built in 1880. So Ted rides past this mansion all the time, and he's, all, he's been conjuring up the, um, a sense of what goes on this, in this abandoned mansion, and he dreams up this very pretentious and haughty family. And uh, he starts to imagine a story, and he populates that story with his own family. So we watch the scene dissolve into the mansion. We're in, say, the living room, and the family are all in very extravagant clothing. And we just see that is this Ted's imagination is starting to conjure a story about them. This is the beginning uh, germ for the novel he eventually writes, uh, in The Surf and Terror Fled. So this picks up right after that, and we're now moving into high school years, both for Ted and in Henry's flashbacks. Cut to the exterior of Bellevue, Ohio, an ice skating rink, wintertime day. 15-year-old Ted watches an older high school boy, James Rogers, skating on the pond. He has a crush on James. A few others are also skating. Ted gradually takes to the ice and nervously begins to skate near the perimeter. He is constantly on the lookout for James. James skates by without looking at Ted and performs a few fancier moves and spins. He then turns his body to skate backwards. He skates backwards around the rink more slowly so that as he passes Ted, he is facing Ted's direction. James notices Ted is looking at him. He politely smiles. Ted is paralyzed with his seemingly exposed interest. James observes Ted's awkward expression and behavior and probably senses the reason for it. Quite possibly, James feels some sort of exposure as well for liking the attention. He turns to skate forward to avoid his own embarrassment. We cut to Henry Bellman's study, daytime. He's been reading Ted's letter, and he looks up. You can see that he's feeling some discomfort, and he stares out the window. We dissolve to a flashback. The exterior of Fulton High School, Fulton, Missouri, 1898, during the evening. High school age Henry and Albert are walking around the environs of Fulton High School. They stop and sit on a bench and muse about the future. Henry, where do you think you'll go to college? Albert, my parents want me to go to the University of Mississippi. I hear that's quite a large school and, and very expensive. My father wants me to follow him into the banking business, but that's not what I want. I, I want to study poetry and creative writing. I'd be perfectly happy staying here and going to Aberdeen. I'm sure that's where my grandmother wants me to go, to stay at home and save money. She's very happy that I want to study music 
It's what she's always hoped for me. You're lucky. She believes in your talent. My family doesn't consider writing poetry any great talent. But you're lucky. Your family can afford to send you to such a prestigious university. Too bad we couldn't trade families. I wouldn't trade my grandmother for any amount of money. I'll miss you terribly when I leave. I'll miss you too. Will you promise to write me letters? Yes, of course. If you promise to write me, I promise. I'll write you poems. You know how much I like your poems. You know how much I like you. Henry and Albert hold each other's eyes. Albert slowly moves his face toward Henry's and gently kisses his mouth. Henry closes his eyes, stiffly accepting the kiss. Albert's eyes are open. He gently retreats with a slight smile as Henry keeps his eyes closed an extra moment. He's disoriented. We dissolve back to Henry's study. The elder Henry is still facing out the window, but his eyes are closed, lingering in the memory. He slowly turns his face forward, opens his eyes, and looks back at the letter to read. We cut to the interior of the Burr home kitchen during the day. It's lunchtime. Helen Burr, with apron and kitchen spoon in hand, is expecting the children home for lunch. There's a knock at the door. It's Ted's friend, Jean. Hello, Jean. Where's Teddy? Gee, Mrs. Burr, that's what I was going to ask you. I, Ted wasn't at school today. I, I thought he must be sick. No, he left for school this morning like he always does. I hope he's all right, Mrs. Burr. Uh, please let me know when you, when you find him. I will, Jean. Thanks for letting me know. A few moments later, Lynn, Mark, Jerry, and Martha arrive home for lunch. Helen questions them at the doorway as they enter. Helen to Lynn. Where's Teddy? I don't know. Who cares? Mark. I didn't see him, Mom. Maybe he stopped at the movie theater like he usually does. Jerry, did you see Teddy today? No. Martha is quiet. Martha, do you know where Teddy is? Uh, probably the movie theater. Yeah, I, I think I saw him walking toward the movie theater. Martha Elizabeth Burr, I know when you are lying to me. Oh, Ma, he made me promise not to tell. Young lady, you tell me where he is this very instant. He went to Cleveland. Cleveland? Why in the world... He took the 9.30 train. By himself? What on earth would possess him to do such a thing? He said he was going to the opera. Oh, my God. When your father hears about this, Helen takes a deep breath, exhales. Cut to the interior of a train car day. The train is pulling into the Cleveland station. Ted holds a newspaper clipping about a production of Wagner's The Ring as he looks out the window. Cut to the exterior of Cleveland's Terminal Tower. Ted is wide-eyed as he encounters the big city. Interior of Cleveland's Lyle and Haley's Music Store. Ted finds the vocal score of Wagner's Valkyrie and buys it. Cut to the interior of a restaurant in downtown Cleveland. While Ted eats his food, he studies the Valkyrie score. Cut to the interior of Cleveland Public Library. Ted reads a reference book on Wagner's The Ring Cycle. Cut to the exterior of Cleveland's Masonic Temple, the opera venue, in the evening. Ted is among the crowd entering the performance hall. Cut to the interior of the opera house, night. The performance is in progress. Kirsten Flogstadt, wearing a Viking helmet with horns and spear, sings an Isolde aria. Close up, Ted is entranced. Cut to 
the interior of Henry's study. Henry is smiling with his recognition and appreciation for Ted's love of opera. Cut to a memory of Henry's at the interior of the Metropolitan Opera House in New York City, night. The same production of Wagner's The Ring. The Bellamans sit in the dress circle watching the production. A scene with Lawrence Melchior singing a Tristan aria. Catherine is aglow. Henry's expression is one of indifference. We jump cut to the interior of the grand lobby of the of the uh, Metropolitan Opera, it's intermission time. The mezzanine is full of well-heeled patrons. The Bellamans meet with Estelle, the vocal coach, for a so social drink at intermission. Estelle, what did you think of Melchior's performance? Catherine, I think his voice has reached a new level of richness and, and clarity. Henry, he sings very well. His acting is merely serviceable. Estelle, really, Henry? Just serviceable? I admit, I do have a great difficulty separating the man from his craft. You don't live in the same building with him. I cringe every time I encounter him. I abhor his grotesque ego, which is even larger than his grotesque body which he shamelessly flaunts with the inappropriate attire he wears while parading the hallways, and his personal grooming leaves much to be desired. Estelle. Well, now. Catherine says to Estelle, I experience his unusual presence, but I'm still able to appreciate his genius on stage. With a little jab at Henry, I've developed a greater capacity to hold character contradictions. Estelle and Catherine exchange a knowing chuckle. Henry politely grins at the inference. He notices a glamorous woman across the lobby. There's Argentina. I'm going to say hello to her. If you ladies will excuse me, he says to Catherine, I'll see you back at the seats. Estelle raises her eyebrows while Catherine purses her lips. We cut to the interior of the principal's office of Bellevue High School day. The principal. This is so unlike you, Ted. You've maintained perfect attendance until now. I'm sorry, Mrs. McDougal, but I felt justified in going to the opera since Miss Hargrove won't let me into the glee club. I have an extreme interest in music and singing and I consider opera a significant part of my musical education, which I am not getting here in the school. Why has Miss Hargrove not accepted you into the glee club? I don't know. Maybe you should ask Miss Hargrove. I know she lets football players participate in the glee club with much enthusiasm. The principal is caught off guard by Ted's assertion. That's enough, Ted. I think... You'll understand that I cannot excuse your absence. It will set a bad example for the other students, and so it will be reflected on your permanent record. I understand, Mrs. McDougall. I'll also understand that my future absences for attending opera will also not be excused. Well, now, that will be all, Ted. You may return to your class. Yes, Mrs. McDougall. Thank you. Cut to the exterior of the Burr home. It's on the porch at night. Floyd and Helen Burr sit on a swing on their front porch, cringing with what they are hearing from inside the house. Ted practices opera, singing Wagner's Brunhilde's war cry. Ho yo to ho! Ho yo to ho! Ha ha! Ha ha! ha. I do not sing as well as Ted in a soprano voice. And um, you get the picture, though. Uh, we cut to the interior of the Burr home living room. Ted finishes singing a vocal phrase as his father pokes his head through the door and into the living room. Can't you sing something like, I'll take you home again, Kathleen, or carry me home to old Virginie? Highly insulted, Ted grabs his music and stomps out. 
Cut to the exterior of the Burr home, the backyard, goat house. It's night. Ted stomps all the way out to the goat house. He flings open the door and puts his music on the grain barrel. The goat is eating her feed. Well, Minnie, once again you will be my audience. The goat's name is Minnie French, named after his deceased grandmother, Minnie French. He faces the open doorway to project his voice out into the entire neighborhood as he belts out Wagner's Townhauser Aria. A disgruntled Minnie bucks fiercely against the wooden structure. Ted, in the film, the 2000 docudrama at age 75, uh, recalls this story and he says that um, during this scene, Minnie hated Wagner more than his father. <laughs> and we had a great laugh. <laughs> so at this point, I also want to tell you that um, this script, from here on out, there's at times a sense of work in progress because I spend much of my time uh, honing the pilot for that's what a producer really needs to read or see first. Um, there are some times when I'm inserting some scenes that I know what the scene is about, but I haven't fully developed it. And I will tell you about those in a couple of spots. We then cut to the interior of a church hall in Bellevue at night. A vocal recital by Miss Josephine Samus White is in progress. Dressed in a long black gown with a little white collar, she sings beautifully Un Bel Dive, from Puccini's Madame Butterfly. She has one lazy eye that occasionally slides sideways while she's singing. Ted is entranced with her performance. We cut to the exterior of the church hall where Ted is speaking with Miss White. I saw your advertisement looking for new students. I would like to study opera with you. Josephine, how delightful! Please visit me next Saturday at 11 o'clock sharp. Bring with you a brand new notebook and be sure to cut out a picture of an opera singer that you admire and paste it on the front cover. We jump cut to the interior of the home of Miss Samus White. It's her parlor, daytime. Ted shows Miss White his notebook, which is practically filled with pictures from front to back, of all the Metropolitan Opera's greatest stars, Lily Pons, Enzio Pinza, etc., and Kirsten Flagstadt is on the front cover. Josephine is in surprise. My goodness, such adoration! I see you left very little room for your actual lessons. We... Cut to a scene, which I'm calling another inserted scene. And this is where we're back at Josephine's parlor. Ted is having a lesson. When they stop for a moment, Ted tells her that the um, annual high school singing competitions are going to come up, and he has no one to sponsor him since he's not in the glee club. And he asks her if she would sponsor him. She, of course, then does go down to the uh, application center to get an application and enters Ted into the contest. We now cut to the interior of the school gymnasium's vocal competition, daytime. Ted is singing a beautiful rendition of Schumann's German lead, Betan das Gott dich erlet, so rein und so schon. While the, judges, while the judge and others listen, some are spellbound. Some are insecure about having to compete with Ted's performance. His teacher, Miss White, is simply aglow. We cut to the interior of the school hallway outside the gymnasium. Miss Samus White and Ted approach the competition posting board. They are perplexed and heartbroken when they see that the word disqualified is printed in the column where Ted's score should be listed. Cut back to the interior of the school gymnasium. After the last segment of competition includes, concludes, Miss Samus White approaches the judge's table. Excuse me, sir. 
Why, may I ask, have you disqualified my young student from competition? What possibly could he have done wrong? My dear, you've done an excellent job with your student. Don't worry. The boy's future is bright. His talent is a superior one. Yet it does often take a long time for a young boy's voice to change and mature. You must know that I enjoyed his performance immensely. His musicianship was wonderful. His German was superb. He was the only one who even bothered to sing in a foreign language. But, my dear, you entered him in the wrong category. He's not a tenor. He's a soprano. Had you entered him as a soprano, I would have sent him on to the state competition. Miss Samus White, with an ashen expression, turns to see a dejected Ted standing on the sidelines waiting for the news. He looks at her expression and knows it will not be good news. Cut to the interior of Ted's bedroom and the outside hallway. After the doctor finishes examining Ted, he walks out of the room to meet his mother, Helen, in the hallway. The doctor. I'm not certain that there is one particular cause for his condition. It seems that Ted has had various difficulties with life over an extended period of time, which have collected and settled into what I would call a general malaise. He's weak and fatigued. I'd call him dispirited, because he doesn't really exhibit a desire for his condition to improve. When he speaks of it, he seems rather resigned. So what can we do for him? I think that he should just rest a while and not be made to do anything. I'd be concerned that any more of life's pressures could push him further into an even more unpleasant state. I wouldn't want him to harm himself in any way. God forbid, no! I'm going to write a recommendation that he take a leave of absence from school for medical reasons until we see some improvement. Without disturbing him much, you should keep a strong watch on him. Be discreet, bring him his food, look in on him, but let him come out of his shell on his own. Cut to the interior of the Bellevue High School. There is a makeshift photo studio. The students are getting their high school pictures taken for the annual yearbook. Ted is dressed in a one-size-too-large suit, jacket, and tie. His hair is cut shorter, and he wears glasses. He looks pale and sickly. He is trying to recede into the background while waiting for his turn. We jump cut to Ted sitting on the stool, posed for the photo shoot. The photographer is the same one from episode one. How about a smile? Ted doesn't respond. Just a slight smile? Ted sinks further into his shell. Okay, then. One, two, three. Flash. We cut to the interior of the Burr home living room. Ted's parents are looking at his photo proofs. Helen to Floyd. Which one do you like? They all look serious. Not like him tall. I think it's his illness. It has him down. I, I think I like this one. He, he looks studious. Teddy is a good student. Ted enters the room. Teddy, I like this photo. I, I think it represents you best. You look like the good student that you are. None of them are me. They just represent what people want me to be. Teddy, you have to pick one for the high school annual and for our wall. 
Ted looks up at the wall at the family photos. The senior photos of Lynn and Martha are prominently displayed. Cut to a wide shot of the room. Ted is irritated. I don't care which one. Pick the one you want. You're the ones that have to look at it for the rest of your lives. Helen and Floyd look at each other speechless. Cut to the interior of Henry's study, daytime. Henry is reading Ted's letter. Catherine knocks, then pokes her head in the doorway. Am I disturbing you at a critical point? No, I'm just reading a letter. My, that's quite a long letter. It's from a confused boy in Ohio. He recently wrote to me in anguish after reading King's Row. Catherine peers at him with suspicion. He identifies with the character Jamie Wakefield. I see. He's hoping I can help him with his predicament. Oh? He wants to tell me his life story so I can help him to better understand his nature. Perhaps he can help you with your predicament. Perhaps this is the one theme that you could deal with quite successfully in the sequel. I can't imagine how he could help the situation. By helping him, you help yourself with the difficulty in facing the past, which coincidentally may also help your writer's block. Henry's getting a little hot under the collar. You know very well that that where that will lead me. Back to Albert, who is someone I choose not to think about. That's exactly what you may very well need to once and for all rid yourself of his psychic residue. Wouldn't Freud think it's best to go back to the past to best understand and heal the past? You make your point, psychologically speaking. I think Dr. Paris Mitchell would agree that the past will continue to cling to the present until a psychological scalpel cuts it out for good. Henry listens. The way I see it, you could kill two birds with one stone. What's that supposed to mean? You can put your past with Albert to rest while you write about Dr. Paris Mitchell returning to King's Row. He can help his suffering friend, Jamie Wakefield, to overcome his tragic fragility. That's a rather harsh diagnosis. Not at all. It would be most noble of Dr. Mitchell to treat Jamie's condition with both a warm and personal compassion and also a cool and clinical dissection. Henry is attentive. Having known Jamie in a very particular way since childhood, I would think Dr. Mitchell could simultaneously heal both his patient and a particular part of himself at the same time. But Jamie is his friend, not his patient. As the new director of the Bellevue State Sanitarium, Dr. Mitchell could advise Jamie to commit himself under his direct supervision. For what purpose? To rehabilitate him. You mean to change him? To transform him from the inside out? Hmm. I could see how one would think that to be quite plausible. I think Dr. Mitchell would embrace the notion as being quite cutting edge in terms of research and treatment for such a mentally debilitating condition. Consequently, he could become a preeminent voice 
within the emerging new field of psychoanalysis, and perhaps even a leading expert in the practice of behavior modification. That would be a tremendous accomplishment worth writing about. I can see it all quite clearly from your particular point of view. Now I must find my own. But of course, dear, I'm just trying to help you so that you can begin to put your point of pen to paper. Was there something in particular you came in here for? Yes, I received two complimentary tickets to Wagner's Lohengrin at the Met for tonight. Do you wish to join me? Is Melchior singing the lead? You know he is. Then I won't be joining you. That's what I presumed. I already asked Estelle if she would be your understudy for the evening. I presumed you would, since I'm sure you'd much prefer me to be at home writing this evening. They exchange forced grins. After she exits, Bellaman goes back to reading Ted's letter. You're now going to cut back to Bellevue, Ohio, and it's the exterior of the State Theater, and it's night. Ted is approaching the theater. The marquee announces the movie The Great Lie with Betty Davis and Mary Astor. We cut to the interior of the State Theater, and Ted is enamored with a scene in which Mary Astor's character is a famous concert pianist. She's dressed in a long white gown playing a Tchaikovsky symphony. We then cut to the interior of Ted's bedroom that night, and he begins writing his first novel, The Surf and Terror Fled. He stares into space, imagining a scene. We dissolve to the interior of a concert hall, and it's in black and white like a 1940s movie, and Ted imagines himself as the protagonist, Sidney French, a famous androgynous concert pianist. Sidney enters the stage to fervent audience applause. Sidney wears makeup and is dressed in a shimmering white gown, akin to the one Mary Astor wore in The Great Lie. He takes his seat at a black lacquered grand piano and raises his hand to play. We then cut to the interior of an ice cream parlor in Bellevue, and we have Jean and Ted in conversation. Jean, what have you been doing all this time away from school? Do you study at all? Martha brings home my school lessons. After I complete them, she takes them back to be graded. More confidential. I really spend most of my time writing. What are you writing about? You know that story I told you about back when I had my paper route about that big old empty mansion on the hill that has a black iron rod fence around it? Yeah, I'm remembering you telling me something about a strange family that used to live there. That's the story I made up, and you said you liked it so much that I should write it down. That's right, I remember. So that's the novel I'm writing. A whole novel? Really? Mm -hmm. And I changed the location to Bridgeport, Connecticut, next to the ocean. Have you ever been to Connecticut? No, it's just the most prestigious place I can think of, because the family is of high society. Will you let me read some of it? If you really want to. I do. I'd love to be the first one to read it while you're writing it. Okay, and then you can give me your opinion along the way, and so I know how well it's coming along. Oh, Ted, I'm so excited. Through the window, Ted notices Joan dressed in a black taffeta dress walking down the street. Jean, look, there's Joan. How strange. I've never seen her walking all alone before. Didn't you hear? Her mother died a couple of weeks ago. Really? I didn't know. Oh, how sad it must be for her. 
that must be why she's wearing black. I heard that the girls at Higby's aren't very nice to her. They all make fun of her dresses. How do you know that? My cousin Sid, Cindy, she's good friends with Helen Beckworth, and Helen's older sister works at Higby's in the intimate apparel. And she says that the girls in the dresses department think Joan looks so out of place, so old-fashioned, just like her mother from another era. Poor Joan. That's awful that they treat her like that. They're just jealous because she shows some class. It's strange, Ted, because I can picture someone like Joan being one of the characters in your novel. I mean, she's kind of mysterious. No one really knows anything about her. I should write to her to express my condolences and maybe tell her that I'd like to make her acquaintance. Maybe she could use a friend. That's so nice of you to think about her like that. I know what it's like. I don't know what I'd do if you weren't my best friend. And I'm just happy that you're my best friend. We cut to the interior of the Burr home, kitchen, daytime. Ted and his mother are having tea and biscuits. No, Teddy? I simply cannot accept you wasting your life by going into the theater. But the Cleveland Playhouse is the preeminent theater outside of New York. It would mean so much if, if I were selected to be an acting intern. We supported you since graduation because we knew that you needed some time to come back to yourself after your illness. But you're feeling much better now, aren't you? You're well enough to want to be in the theater. Yes. It's important you begin to face the real world and try to gain employment, to establish your stability in your life. I understand, but Helen gets up and takes a newspaper clipping out of a drawer. I cut out this advertisement. I see where the Army is hiring in Dayton. It says that they are in much need of office help during the war effort. This is a stable job, and it would be excellent preparation for you to gain other employment when the war ends. God willing, it will end sooner than later. So you're saying that you want me to leave home? Teddy, it's not that I want you to leave. It's just time for you to leave. Like a bird leaving the nest to begin making your way in the world. Like a mother bird pushing the baby bird out of the nest. I guess I am acting like a mother bird. Then why isn't acting on stage at the Cleveland Playhouse a way of making my way in the world? Because the theater is a pretend world. It doesn't prepare you for real life. Real life is taking responsibility and establishing a home, settling down with your own family someday. And right now, real life is the war. And I have my own responsibilities. I have Martha and the baby to look after. Her husband is in the war. I think you can at least do your part. I'm sorry, but I must insist that you apply for one of those jobs in Dayton. There's no guarantee you'll get hired, but you must at least try. For your sake. And for mine. Ted quietly nods that he will comply. We cut to the interior of Henry's study. Henry lowers the letter, feeling sympathy for Ted. There's a close-up of Henry as he reflects upon his own launching into life. We flash back in a dissolve to the interior of Henry's childhood home, Fulton, Missouri, during the day. Grandmom Oswald sits on her chair, crocheting little bric-a-brac on the collar of a woman's blouse. The young adult Henry sits at her feet. But Grandmom, who will be here to take care of you if I go abroad? Heinrich, you must not stay here with me. You must not even think of me in making your future decisions. I'm an old woman. I've made my life. You must go and make your own life. You must go on with your studies and make something of yourself. You must... 
make use of your God-given talents. They are gifts, so you must use them to accomplish all that you can. That is the most you can ever do for me. Live and accomplish great things. He dissolved back to the interior of Henry's study. He is teary-eyed. He dismisses the emotion and resumes reading Ted's letter. We now cut to the interior of the military base, a clerical office in Dayton, Ohio. And it is during these next scenes, we will skim through some of them because they are little reprises of scenes that we saw in episode one when Ted was working in Dayton. Instead of doing the whole scenes, we're just going to skim through as to remind us as the audience that what he's doing, but also he's telling Henry his life story. So this is for Henry's benefit. And we're just watching him skim through. But we're also seeing some new scenes that weren't shown in the episode about his time in Dayton. So we're at the uh, clerical office. A perfectly coiffed Ted, wearing makeup, sits at the desk typing. Seen through the glass windowed wall, separating the office from the hallway, a few soldiers walk by to get a look at Ted. This is when... Dolores, the supervisor, walks into the office and she sees the soldiers and shushes them away. Ted notices that them scuffling off and smiles to himself because he knows that they had been looking at him. We then cut to an off-base restaurant. Ted and his three girlfriends are chatting about their experiences with men, which we saw in episode one. Everyone in the restaurant is staring at Ted amongst the girls. We then cut to the exterior streets near, near the military base in Dayton. And as Ted is walking home from work, uh, cars are honking as they pass by, whistles are heard, soldiers are making suggestive gestures to him as he walks by. In this environment, Ted feels more insecure, even somewhat frightened by all of the attention. We cut back to Henry's study. Henry is somewhat bothered by the themes of the letters at this point, and he lowers the letter to his lap. He takes off his glasses to massage his eyes. He frowns a little as he reflects upon a past situation of his own. We dissolve to the interior of a drinking bar in New York City, 1927. There is quite a boisterous crowd of uniformed sailors on leave. Many drink and carouse with women of all ages. Henry is seated in a far corner of the bar in conversation with one of the sailors, a very pretty boy with clipped hair and, and in uniform. Enamored with the boy, he puts his hand on the boy's leg. The boy freezes a little. Henry pats his leg, then removes his hand. Henry signals for the bartender, then orders another round for himself and the sailor. Henry looks back at the sailor, who is blushing. We cut back to the Dayton clerical office, and Ted is typing when a shop foreman enters and comes close to his desk. I'm here to uh, pick up the supply forms. Ted is confused. Oh, yes, I, I have them ready, but I, I'm not late with them. I, I usually deliver them all at 8.30. Ted hands the shop foreman the forms in a more hushed tones. No, no, you're not late at all. I, I just thought I should let you know that there's some talk going around the shop. Apparently, Clyde, who works the hole punch machine, told a couple of guys that he would like to ask you out on a date. You know how guys are. That, that kind of news gets around really fast. But... I don't even know who Clyde is. I only go into the shops to do my job, to deliver the order forms and, and pick up the attendance sheets. That's all. Please, don't get upset. Please. I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm just telling you that some of the guys have eyes for you. And, well, you should take it as a compliment. I mean, I admit, I've had some of the same thoughts myself, if I thought you'd ever look my way. I I really should get back to work now. I'm I'm sorry if 
you'll excuse me, I, I have so much work I, I need to accomplish with a major, I, I can't keep him waiting. The shop foreman feeling rejected. I understand. Ted softens a moment. Mr. Miller, thanks for picking up the forms. Um, you, you saved me a lot of time. The foreman is grateful. Anytime. Anytime you want me to do it. We now cut to a series of scenes in a quicker tempo because they are reprising. Uh, we cut to Ted sitting at his desk, coiffed, made up, and he's typing. And another secretary is filing. And Dolores comes in from the inner office, the major's office, motions for the secretary to leave the area. And then she walks, the supervisor walks over to Ted and puts her hand on his shoulder, which we saw in episode one. And he looks up at her. And we know in that image that she's telling him that the major wants his resignation. And then we quickly jump cut to the major's face saying, either be a woman or be a man, but for God's sakes, pick one. And then we see Ted's expression in turmoil. We dissolve to the interior of the Burr home in Bellevue, and it's a reprise of Ted and his mother in the kitchen, where Ted's arms are around his mother and his chin is resting over her shoulder, and he is teary-eyed, and we hear his voiceover. Could it be that any woman could suffer in being a woman, as I have suffered in not being one? Then Ted lets go of his mother, and he sinks down to her side. She brushes his hair away from his face. She cups his face tenderly, a little cry in her voice. No matter what in the world happens, Teddy, Always remember, you have a home here where you are loved. Dissolve to the interior of Henry's study. It's daytime. He gets up and moves to his desk. He places Ted's letter on the desk, and he sits for a moment in thought. Then he looks at the scene that he had written earlier, and he moves it to the side. He reaches into a drawer to get some stationery. He begins to write. My dear Ted Burr, we hear Henry's voice in voiceover as he writes. I was moved by your letter, and I feel that perhaps I have a good deal to say to you, gradually, as I know you better. We cut to the interior of Ted's bedroom. Ted's lying on his bed reading Henry's letter. We hear Henry's voiceover. First off, Let's try to not let's try not to think of yourself as abnormal. So far as being different is concerned, we may say each of us is unique. Although you are clearly different in one respect, somewhere in the deeps of your psychological and maybe physical makeup, you are not wholly masculine. We cut back to Henry. Voice over. You wish you were a woman. But you are not a woman, and since you aren't a woman, you can't be wholly feminine. Most fine men have a deep strain of feminine sensitiveness and intuition, but being really sissy is something else. We cut back to Ted reading, Henry's voiceover. When I know you better and you trust me fully, there are some questions I'd like to ask. Not now. I want to come at once to the primary purpose of this letter. You say you have tried to write a book, a book about yourself, if it, is, if it could be well-written, revealing, and true, might be an important book. Ted is stunned by the mention of his novel. He stands up with the letter and begins pacing as he reads. We cut back to Henry, but Henry is still writing at his desk. Voice over. What you so sorely need is achievement. If you could accomplish something, Make some money out of it. Win yourself back to your own genuine respect. Most of your problems would be simplified. Cut back to Ted's bedroom. Henry's voiceover. About your book now. Send it to me. Perhaps I can help you plan form and expression. It depends on how good or bad it is. Ted's jaw drops. He's almost breathless. He jumps up and down. 
we cut back to Henry's study. He says in voiceover, Incidentally, will you send me some snapshots of yourself or photos? I am sure you are a very good-looking boy. There's a close-up of Henry's face with an ever-so-slight smile on his face. Sincerely, Henry Bell. We now cut to the interior of the ice cream parlor again in Bellevue, and Ted and Jean are in the parlor. Jean, how's your novel coming along? Are you almost done? Actually, I finished it a couple of days ago. What? Ted, that's great news. It is. Well, why didn't you bring it for me to read? You know how excited I am. I don't have it in my possession at the moment. What? What? Where is it? Confidentially. Now, Jean, I have to something very important to tell you, and you are the only person I'm going to tell. So I need you to promise me you won't tell anyone. I promise, I swear. You remember when you told me about the novel King's Row? Yes. Well, I wrote to the author. You mean the author of the book? Yes. Henry Bellamy, and he asked to read my novel. Oh my God, Ted, that's that's so. Oh, oh my God, Ted, I mailed it off to him yesterday. Can you believe it? No, I I I can't believe you even got the idea to write to him in the first place. You're a genius. The rising sounds of a larger commotion is heard outside. Several people in a panic run past the ice cream parlor windows. Ted and Jean are startled by the outside activity. As more people are running and yelling, there is an increasing ominous sense. Instinctually, Ted and Jean quickly exit the ice cream parlor to follow the crowd down the street. We cut to the exterior streets of Bellevue. Running down the street, Ted and Jean turn the corner where many more people are gathered in the middle of the street near an apartment building. A white stream of tied sheets is swinging mid-air with a body hanging by the neck. The black taffeta dress is immediately recognizable to all. Closer to the building, a deafening silence grows. Ted puts his hands to his mouth, gasping for breath. Police and rescuers are gathering with ladders to attempt liberating the hanging body. Jean holds onto Ted's arm tightly. Close up of Ted. Joan? No. There's a slow crossfade to the exterior of the Burr home, the front lawn. Solemnly and silently, Ted and Jean walk on the sidewalk. They stop at the front of the Burr property. Ted. If only I had written that letter to Joan. Maybe you didn't know. I guess I could have written to her too. Imagine what the girls at Higby's are going to feel. Somewhat comforted by Jean's words, Ted slightly nods. Dealing with her own discomfort, Jean backs away. Just keep thinking about your novel, Ted. Good things. Tell me the first thing what the author says about it. Jean leaves. Unable to go inside, Ted's body instinctually heads for the backyard. We cut to the backyard of the Burr home, and Ted lies under the cherry tree in the midst of the fallen colored leaves. He looks up at the half-barren branches. Several rather elaborate and ornate wooden birdhouses are hanging from the branches. They appear more prominent with less leaves around them. There is an A-frame stepladder nearby. 
Ted's father, Floyd, approaches the tree carrying his latest elaborate wooden birdhouse creation. He places it on the ground for a moment. He climbs the stepladder and removes a nest from inside one of the birdhouses. Ted sits up and watches Floyd in silence. Floyd to himself. Oh, damn sparrows. He throws the nest into a tin can nearby. He takes out a lighter and begins to burn the nest. Ted. Dad, why, why are you doing that? Don't sparrows need a home too? Floyd is busy with his task of hanging the new birdhouse. They can find somewhere else. I like different birds flying around my houses. More colorful ones, like purple martins and cardinals and blue jays. I don't make my birdhouses for any old common sparrows. Deeply upset, Ted stands up and moves toward the house. Then he stops and turns back. And there's a voice we have never heard from him yet. It's a shame that people who are different and more colorful aren't treated as well as you treat those birds. Floyd stops his action and looks at Ted surprised and puzzled. Ted matches his father's eyes gaze for a moment. Especially since most of the folk around this town are as common as sparrows. Floyd's coloring turns to ash. Ted turns around and enters the back door, slamming it. Fade out. End of episode two. Well, thank you for joining me for all of episode two. And now you have two episodes that you have seen. And we'll see what happens in a third episode, hopefully in the new year sometime. Uh, if you have any comments or questions or any perceptions of what you've been gathering as you've gone through both episodes now, uh, feel free to put them in the comments below and we'll have discussions. Uh, thanks again for joining me and see you again next year for episode three.